How do you discover a new particle? Today, the day this video is published, it's the 4th of July, 2022, which means it's a very special day today. Yeah, USA, 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 USA. Okay, yeah, that, that too. But no, that, that's not what I meant. What I meant was that 10 years ago, on the 4th of July, 2012, the discovery of a new particle was announced. The Higgs particle. The specific result that was presented were graphs like these. These graphs show the existence of a previously undiscovered particle and got particle physicists all over the world excited. But that might make you wonder why, though. Why are these graphs so great? What do they show exactly? And how do they prove the existence of a new particle? On this very special day, let's take some time to discover the answers to those questions. So, today on Fundamentally Explained, how was the Higgs particle discovered in some graphs? To start off, let's start by stating the obvious. It's not easy to discover a particle. <gasps> no. There are many reasons for this, but one of the main ones is that most particles are unstable. They change into other ones in a fraction of a second. We call this particle decay. The average time it takes a certain particle to decay is called its average lifetime. An average lifetime of 0 0.0000000000000001 second are not rare. I don't think I need to say that this is very short. Too short, in fact, to measure that particle directly. To make things even worse, the newly produced particles can also be unstable and decay themselves as well. Same is true for their decay products and theirs. And this can go on and on until, at some point, all final particles are stable. This might sound hopeless if you want to find that original particle, but where physics taketh away hope, it also giveth a solution. Not always, but in this case it does. As discussed in the videos on antimatter and the standard model, some quantities are conserved in particle interactions, and therefore also in particle decays. Electric charge is an example of this, but also energy. As a result, the total charge and energy of the decay product is the same as the charge and the energy of the original particle. By looking at the properties of the decay products, we can thus determine some of the properties of that initial particle. There is, however, a slight complication. The decay of a particle with a specific type is not always the same. We can't say that the Higgs particle always decays into, let's say, top quarks, because it doesn't. Sometimes, yeah, but not always. A decay to a specific set of final particles is called a decay channel, of which there are very often many. The decay to two top quarks is one of these decay channels for the Higgs particle, but there's also a channel in which the Higgs decays to two bottom quarks, a channel to two muons, a channel to charm quarks, and many, many more. The problem? We can't predict which channel is chosen. It is, to a certain degree, random. In order to discover a decaying particle like the Higgs boson, we generally pick one or a couple of these decay channels to look at specifically. Essentially, we say, okay, I know I'm looking for a particle and I know it can decay into a gazillion different final states, but I will only look at the situation in which it decays to these particles. Cool, you might say. Let's run the experiment and test if we measure the specific set of particles that we chose. But hold your horses, there's a complication. Again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Because final states are not unique. The Higgs boson is not the only particle that can create, say, these final states. Also, the Z boson can decay into them, for example. And the gluon also covers some of them. Even if the Higgs would not exist, we would still expect to measure these sets of particles every so often. Less often, sure, but not never. Seeing a specific set of particles in your experiment is just no guarantee whatsoever you've created a specific particle to begin with. However, measuring particles is only one part of the job. 
You also need to interpret the data that you collect, and this is our saving grace. To see what such an interpretation looks like, let's look at an example experiment in which we try to determine if a die is unfair. Imagine doing that. You roll a die and get a 6 as a result. What does that tell you? Well, not a lot. You expect to roll a 6 every so often, even if the die is fair. In order to say something about the fairness of the die, you'd need to roll it many times and count how many times you see each result. You can put the results of your counting in a table like this one, but also more graphically in a diagram like this. This specific diagram shows that each result was obtained more or less the same number of times, which matches with what you would expect for a fair die. However, if you measure a result like this one, you could say with great certainty that the die is not fair. There are way more sixes than you would expect. Of course, there's a gray area, as there are always random fluctuations. A fair die might give you this result, but also this one, this one, this one, or, or this one. To represent this intrinsic uncertainty, we use uncertainty bars, like these. They essentially say, I know this is the result of my counting, but due to randomness, it would not have been unreasonable if I would have counted this, or something like this. The further away from the actual measurement, the more unlikely that alternative result would be. But of course, regardless of this uncertainty, in the end you would want to make some statement about the fairness of the die. This extreme result we just saw was clearly extreme, even if we take the uncertainties into account. Does that make this result absolutely impossible for a fair die? No. No, just very, very unlikely. And that's the only thing we can do. We can only try to determine how likely the result we measured is under the assumption that our expectation is true. If the result is unlikely enough, or in science speak, if the deviation from the expectation is significant enough, then we say, well, this is so unlikely, our expectation is very likely wrong. Essentially, the same procedure is used in the interpretation of data in particle physics as well. We pick a final state and count how many times we see it. We also determine how many times we would expect to see that final state if the particle we are looking for would not exist. If our count differs enough from the expectation that there is no new particle, we can say that our expectation of no new particle is probably false and that we thus discovered a new particle or some new physics effect that we didn't take into account. For particles specifically, we can do something very smart in this counting process. Remember the idea of conserved quantities we discussed earlier. For each detected set of particles, we can use the conservation of energy to calculate the mass of the original particle, also called the invariant mass. If the Higgs were to exist, we would not just count more of these final states, but these additional particle sets would have an invariant mass around the mass of the Higgs particle specifically. The additional states will therefore not only tell us whether the Higgs particle exists, but also what its mass is. A bit like how the counts in our die experiment told us the unfair die was favoring 6 instead of, say, 2. So, counting and calculating the invariant mass. That's the plan. No more complications. You are now fully versed in particle physics analysis 101. Let's look at what you probably came here for, the discovery of the Higgs. And let's look at these specific final states. We know that, even without the Higgs, we would measure these sets of particles every so often. There are multiple processes that can yield these results. We therefore make a prediction for how many times you would expect to see these particles if only these other processes existed. We can do this for all relevant processes, yielding this expectation for the invariant masses, grouped in bins. The different colors indicate the different processes that spawned these final states. This is our expectation for our measurements. And now that we have it, we need to compare it to those actual measurements. If there were a Higgs particle, we would see our final states more often. So we would then expect to see an excess of counts somewhere in this graph. The actual result is 
this. Now, well, I kinda, kinda see a peak around here, which could be a new particle, but is this deviation large enough? Isn't this result just a coincidence? Data interpretation is needed to determine the probability whether or not this specific excess is just some random fluctuation, or if that excess would be so unlikely that we can essentially say, now, nah, this is actually something. This result alone is unfortunately not enough to make such a statement. However, a similar excess in the same decay channel at the same invariant mass was found by another experiment. Here is their plot with, indeed, a peak at a similar value for the invariant mass. Not only that, but both experiments also found similar peaks in plots for other decay channels. The probability that all these measurements lined up in this way by sheer chance was calculated to be 1 in over 2 million. 1 in over 2 million. So yeah, we can definitely say that our expectation of no new particles is wrong. But does that also mean the existence of the Higgs particle? Our expectation, no new particles, might be wrong, but that does not automatically mean that our alternative explanation, there is a Higgs, is right. To test if the Higgs particle exists, we need to make a prediction for the Higgs particle as well. How many extra particle sets would we count if the Higgs were indeed to exist? If the Higgs were to exist, this alternative prediction would match the data better than our current prediction does. This is the additional contribution, and you can see that we can match the data way better with it than without. Not only in this plot, by the way, but also in all other plots that were made. After this whole story, we can conclude two things. One, our hypothesis of there are no new particles is wrong. 1 in 2 million, remember? And 2. That the existence of the Higgs particle provides a good explanation for our measurements. Or said a bit simpler, we found a new particle. We found the Higgs. Almost 60 years ago, in 1964, a prediction was made that this particle, the Higgs particle, should exist. Then, 50 years later, the first evidence for its existence was presented. And today, today you learned to understand this friggin' official particle physics plot. That is no small feat. And you now also know that particle physics analysis is, to a certain degree, just counting results and comparing them to expectations. Of course, that's not the whole story of particle physics. There's also a theory that needs to be developed and used. And there are experiments to be engineered and built, but the simple core idea of the analysis is still this. Just count results and compare them to your expectation. If you liked this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Not only does it really help to make this channel reach a wider audience, it also makes sure that you don't miss any of the videos that I'll make. Oh yeah, th there will be more videos. You can count on that. How does that compare to your expectation? <laughs> well, I, I hope the answer is well. For now, this is it. So, see you next time.